It's hard to stay on top of the rapidly changing literature and the limited hours we have in a day. So here at Stay Current, we are starting an ultra-focused podcast series, Topics in 10, for those times you need just the cliff notes. Let's get to it. Have you ever asked, what exactly is Wilms tumor? Wilms tumor is the second most common intra-abdominal tumor in children and fifth most common tumor in children overall, and its management is often changing. Dr. Andrew Davidoff, chairman of surgery at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, joins us to give us the essentials. Approximately 75% of the cases occur in children younger than five years of age, with a peak incidence at two to three years of age. Thankfully, survival for patients with Wilms tumor, when considered as a whole, is currently greater than 90%. However, a critical prognostic factor that profoundly impacts outcome is histology. This is divided simply into two broad types, favorable and unfavorable or anaplastic histology. The latter group comprises, thankfully, only about 10% of cases, but does contribute to over 50% of Wilms tumor mortality. Talk to me about how these children present typically. Well, interestingly, children with Wilms tumor typically present with an asymptomatic abdominal mass. Uh, Associated signs and symptoms such as malaise, pain, microscopic or gross hematuria are found in only about 25% of the children, as is hypertension. So when a child presents with an abdominal mass, what's the typical workup? The workup of a child with an intra-abdominal mass that you suspect of being a Wilms tumor usually begins with ultrasound. CT of the abdomen and pelvis is generally the definitive imaging study of choice for those patients who are suspected of having a renal tumor based on ultrasound. CT will confirm the presence of a solid renal mass and will also afford the opportunity to visualize the contralateral kidney to confirm its presence and function and to exclude synchronous bilateral disease. Intravascular tumor extension occurs in about 6% of Wilms tumor cases. Therefore, this should be specifically investigated in preoperative evaluation as it may alter the timing and conduct of surgery. If intracardiac extension of tumor thrombus is suspected, this can be assessed by echocardiography. And where does Wilms metastasize to? The most common site of metastatic spread of Wilms tumor is the lungs, and so a chest CT should be included in the initial evaluation of a child suspected of having Wilms tumor. Can you go over the staging of Wilms tumor for me? Sure. So the children's oncology group currently uses a surgical pathologic staging system in which localized Wilms tumors that are confined within the renal capsule are stage one, while those that penetrate the renal capsule but are resected with negative margins are stage two. Circumstances that make Wilms tumor stage three are various and include biopsy or rupture, either preoperative or intraoperative, positive resection margin or gross residual disease, lymph node involvement, or the administration of preoperative chemotherapy. Metastatic disease, which occurs in about 12% of patients, uh, is considered stage four, although the local stage should also be evaluated as this will determine whether abdominal irradiation is indicated and to what field. Patients with synchronous bilateral Wilms tumor are stage five, but here again, local stage for each side should still be evaluated. Talk to me about the treatment of a child who's diagnosed with Wilms tumor. Sure. So for unilateral tumors, upfront resection with regional lymph node sampling is currently the recommendation from the children's oncology group. And by upfront resection, that's generally radical nephrectomy. And the reason why this approach is favored by the COG is twofold. First, Although Wilms tumors can grow to a large size, even large tumors rarely invade surrounding structures. And so because of this, most Wilms tumors are resectable at presentation. Secondly, uh, the failure to perform an upfront resection, but instead administering neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the COG results in the classification of the tumor as stage three, thus mandating the use of uh, other therapies, including flank irradiation, and doxorubicin, each of which is associated with significant long-term toxicities. 
treatment of favorable histology Wilms tumor that's stage one or two is just limited to vincristin and actinomycin D. And more recently, in rare circumstances, when the tumor is stage one, weighs less than 550 grams, that's the tumor weight plus the kidney, and the patient is less than two years of age, no adjuvant chemotherapy is given. And actually, raising the age and the weight limits of the tumor plus kidney are currently being considered uh, for study by COG. But it is important that careful lymph node sampling be done as it's a critical part of any operation for Wilms tumor because the presence of nodal involvement is associated with an increased incidence of tumor relapse and a poorer prognosis, although effective, albeit more intensive therapy exists to treat children with stage three disease. So lymph, lymph node sampling should be performed even in the absence of abnormal nodes on preoperative imaging or on gross inspection during operative exploration, since these circumstances really don't reliably predict lymph node negativity. Partial nephrectomy for patients with unilateral non-syndromic disease and or laparoscopic nephrectomy are really not currently standard of care and should generally only be performed in the context of a clinical trial. And finally, as, as I mentioned previously, anaplastic histology is unfortunately associated with a significantly worse outcome and so is treated with more intensive chemotherapy. There is a distinction, uh, though, made between focal and diffuse anaplasia when determining uh, specific adjuvant therapy. Talk to me about a child that presents with bilateral Wilms tumor. Of course. So about 5% of children with Wilms tumor will present with synchronous bilateral disease or stage 5 disease. And in these circumstances, due to an increased risk of renal failure for these patients, they receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, with uh, three drugs as used for patients with stage 3 or stage 4 favorable histology Wilms tumor uh, in an effort to shrink the tumors prior to surgery and to facilitate the preservation of, of normal renal parenchyma. Also treated in this manner are patients with Wilms tumor arising in a solitary kidney, or uh, as I mentioned before, those with unilateral Wilms tumor who are at an increased risk for developing metachronous tumor, although these patients usually don't receive doxorubicin as part of their neoadjuvant chemotherapy. A biopsy is not required in children uh, with bilateral solid renal masses as bilateral Wilms tumor is the very likely diagnosis, although the histologic subtype, favorable or unfavorable, won't be known. Uh, studies have shown that biopsies of bilateral renal masses rarely detect anaplasia, even when it does exist uh, in the tumor mass. However, a biopsy, if performed, doesn't mandate subsequent radiation as it does in patients with unilateral Wilms tumor. Bilateral nephron sparing surgery should really be considered in all patients with bilateral Wilms tumor. This should be performed after either six or 12 weeks of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Longer courses of preoperative chemotherapy are definitely discouraged. So how do you manage a patient that presents with intravascular tumor extension? Yeah, so these cases can be quite challenging. It, it should be determined by preoperative imaging that there is or isn't uh, intravascular tumor extension, then its presence or absence confirmed intraoperatively. Tumor extension into the renal vein and, and proximal uh, inferior vena cava can in most cases be removed and blocked with the kidney and tumor. Thrombus that extends further into the vena cava can also be withdrawn from the IVC after gaining proximal and distal control. Proximal control can generally be achieved if the superior extent of the thrombus is below the level of the hepatic veins. However, primary resection of tumors with extension above the level of the hepatic veins, or especially into the, the atrium, is associated with higher operative morbidity, and so neoadjuvant chemotherapy is generally used in these circumstances. Thrombus that extends above the hepatic veins and which persists to this extent after neoadjuvant chemotherapy probably requires cardiopulmonary bypass to safely remove the full extent of disease. So what if the patient presents with metastases? 
Yeah, so a, about 12% of Wilms tumor patients will have evidence of hematogenous metastases at diagnosis, with 80% of these being pulmonary metastases. Interestingly, a new response-based approach is being used for the patients uh, with stage 4 disease in the children's oncology group. These patients treated with three-drug chemotherapy who have radiographic disappearance of their lung metastases or who have tissue confirmation that residual nodules don't contain viable tumor, at week six imaging reevaluation will be considered rapid responders, will continue on this three-drug chemotherapy regimen, but won't receive pulmonary radiation. And patients who don't respond? Patients who don't have complete resolution of pulmonary nodules at six weeks will be considered slow or incomplete responders. They will be switched to more intensive chemotherapy regimen and will receive whole lung radiation. You did it. You just made it through a blitzkrieg on Wilms tumor. So here's a quick recap of our clinical pearls. Wilms is the most common renal tumor in children. It has an outstanding overall survival at greater than 90%, but that's worse with anaplastic histology. The treatment for unilateral disease is a radical nephrectomy with lymph node sampling, followed by venchristine and actinomycin B for stages one and two. For stage three, add doxorubicin and radiation therapy. For bilateral disease, neoadjuvant three drug therapy and then nephron sparing surgery, if possible, is the way to go. If there's intravascular involvement, the approach is based on the extent of the tumor. If it's above the hepatic veins, give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And for lung metastasis, management is now response-based to avoid pulmonary radiation. So that was our first topic in 10. What do you think? Should we continue doing these podcasts? What topics do you want us to cover? Let us know by messaging us on the Stay Current and Pediatric Surgery app, or give us a shout out on Facebook or Twitter. This chapter is created and edited by Todd Ponsky, Alex Kassar, Alex Gibbons, and myself, Ray Hankey. Remember, knowledge should be free.